Hello, happy Memorial Day. I hope you're having a fantastic time with your families. I'm just hanging out here today and I'm gonna answer questions. So if there's anything softball related or mental game related or, you know, I was just talking to my mom, like parent, player relationship related, anything that you guys want to know about the game of softball or just basically anything, that's what I'm here to answer today. So I wanted to start off with a quote for Memorial Day, um, but this was said by John F. Kennedy. As we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. So that's today's quote that was said by John F. Kennedy. Um, it's a beautiful day. And I'm so happy to just be home with family right now. It's been a crazy, crazy journey these past few weeks. So let's see what type of questions you guys have. Vincent, when you encountered fears in the game, how or what did you do to overcome them? That's a really good question. So I guess you could say, you know, when I first started playing, I had a lot more fears than when I got older, but the fears changed, right? Um, like the fear of striking out was not a fear that I normally had, um, like when I was a little bit older. When I was younger, I had fear of striking out. Um, but I guess that specific scenario, let's see, like if I had, if I was scared to strike out, um, what I would do is I would, I would really focus on the thing that I wanted to do. So, and here's where I kind of figured out the sports psychology aspect of this all. But um, what helps with that is being able to focus on the vision, focus on what you want to do versus what you don't. Um, and this is just how the human brain works. So if you tell yourself, don't strike out, don't strike out, don't strike out, you're gonna do whatever it takes to try not to strike out, but your focus is a strikeout and you're likely gonna do that. So I would say that to encounter a fear, try to think of like what the opposite of the fear is. So if you're fearful to strike out, what's like the opposite of a strikeout is probably a hit, right? Some people may go extreme and say a home run, but if you're even focusing on a home run or a hard swing or a line drive, you're gonna put a lot better swing on a ball that you decide to go for than if you're trying not to strike out. So instead of being fearful of the strikeout, you kind of flip your brain um, to then tell yourself what you want to do. Therefore, whether you're, it doesn't mean you're always gonna be safe or you know have a perfect hit, but you're setting yourself up for success in that regard. So if you're ever fearful of something, I would say, what's the opposite of what you're scared of? So like if you're scared of a ball going through your legs, which, hey, been there, a ball's gone through my legs so many times, but if I like think the opposite, okay, give me the next ball, I'm ready for the next ball, and you're like anticipating it, it's likely not going to happen again because you want the ball and you're going to do whatever it takes to get it. So I hope that makes sense. So if you're ever fearful, really focus on what you want to do or what you can control. Here's a sneak peek. So I don't think I've told my team this, but my team as in the people that work for Ashley Burkhart Training, um, I am launching a podcast and I'm so excited. I'm letting you guys know this because nobody's asked questions, so I'm just going to let you know. Um, and what's exciting about this is um, it's going to be, so basically it's going to be interviews with people, parents, players, and talking about what their relationship with their parents have been. Um, so basically like the upbringing of the athlete. So, um, for example, a lot of people are like, Oh my gosh, you got to get your dad on a live because I talk about my dad all the time in our relationship when I was growing up and the sacrifices that he made for me to succeed. And I was like, I feel like it would be a really cool conversation to be able to talk to parents and have parents, um, you know, express, you know, how they got their athletes through these journeys. And, you know, me playing professionally, like obviously my dad and my parents had to make a lot of sacrifices to make that happen. So in my mind, I was like, I need to make a podcast. So like parents can listen to what a great relationship looks like between a player and an athlete and you know when the athlete wants to do something like what can the parent do to almost support that athlete and do whatever it is that's going to help them succeed so um that's that's the idea behind the podcast it's going to be uh, me interviewing a lot of people like i've already talked to some of my pro friends from the pro league i've talked to shoot i've talked to my own parents well Talk to my mom about it. I still didn't talk to my dad. Um, but basically just like, interviews about, you know, my journey growing up and also like hearing what the journeys were like for Natasha Watley, Monica Abbott, just like other pro athletes like Lauren, Lauren Chamberlain, Lauren Hager. Like these are people that I'm thinking of that I love to interview um, to be able to see, you know, what was their journey like? Um, going through, you know, <laughs> figuring out how far they're going to get through this game. So I am excited about 
that. Um, I can't tell you what day it's going to launch yet because that's a surprise. Um, but I'm very, very excited and I cannot wait to share these interviews with you guys because I have been hooked to podcasts for the past, I would say, you know, probably year and a half, two years. And I'm listening to podcasts like while I'm driving, it makes it go by really fast. Um, I listen to podcasts while I'm cooking, like things that I can do in my sleep. I'm always listening to a podcast. I'm listening to business podcasts. I'm listening to baseball podcasts, softball podcasts. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Um, so basically that's going to be what's happening here soon. And I wanted to kind of let you guys know, this is actually a really good question and I want to, okay, hopefully. All right. So I'm going to read out the question. And I'm going to answer it. It's kind of long. Uh, I have a really hard but important question to ask you. Over the last several seasons, I have had some great teams that could absolutely smash, no pun intended, <laughs> on paper. They are awesome and they usually start off every game with a punch in the mouth to the other team. They, they will usually lead every game until the very end when all the wheels fall off. Bottom line is they cannot close the deal. This has happened the last three or four seasons. I've even switched organizations, leading me to believe that the issue lies within me. What do you think I might be doing wrong? This is a coach. What do you think I might be doing wrong that they may be sending the wrong message to them? Oh, okay. That is time to stop playing. I, that it's time to stop playing. I'm not going to toot my own horn, but the girls like me and so do their parents. I have never had any of those types of issues. I need help. Thanks for listening. Okay. This is a great question. I actually love this question. Renee, thank you for asking it. So basically, um, what, so what she's saying is that you know, normally when the game starts, like they put the punch in the gut, they set the tone really high, but being able to have that until the very end of the game is something that they lack. So this is actually very, very common. Like you're not the only team that does this. So do not, um, do not like take it too hard on yourself that this is what happens to you. Um, likely when things like that are happening, it's like when the spark starts, it's being able to like keep the spark throughout the whole game. So in my opinion, I think that's maybe the athlete saying, okay, well, we came out hot. Like, let's just settle in and just like, here's the bar. You started high. Let's just keep it right where it is. And here's the deal. Whether you're up by 20, whether you're up by three, your job is to put the same amount of runs on the board that you did the inning before if you started out hot like that. So I would say, I would encourage these athletes to say, okay, we found a way to get three runs this inning. Now our job is to find a way to get three runs the next inning. And okay, maybe we only got one. Okay, but remember that one inning where we got three? Remind yourself of what that felt like because likely when runs are happening, um, hitting is contagious, right? So when one hitter's hitting well, the next hitter's probably gonna be like, okay, she just crushed it, I'm gonna crush it too, let's go, let's keep going. So it's, it's an energy thing. So being able to hold the energy till the very end is sometimes hard, because if you start off with all the energy, you're pumped, and then by the end, you're kind of like depleting because you're just sitting here like, oh my gosh, we just start, we started too hot and now we're just tired. That's another thing. If your players are tired by the last innings, like y'all probably should do some more conditioning so you can still be at your prime come the seventh inning. That's the whole goal, right? So if it's a tiredness thing, I would say really focus on um, making sure they're conditioned enough because once it starts getting hot and it's like 95, 100 degrees and y'all are playing in this, welcome to softball. Um, if you're not conditioned, you're not going to be able to hold, you know, a seven inning game and then maybe have to play another seven inning game after. So if that's the deal, definitely really focus on conditioning. But if it's just the spark is kind of gone, your job as a coach is to keep motivating them and, sh and telling them, you know, this is how we got three runs. Um, just because this chick hit a home run didn't mean that she was the only one that got that run for us. Two other people got on base. So keep encouraging, you know, other players to step up in that situation and just encourage them and say, this is how we got to three and this is how we're going to get another three. So just keep like putting, dangling the, the trophy, the bait in front of them so that they have to go catch it. And so if they score another three innings or three, sorry, another three runs, like we're in a good place, right? So we're just going to keep building upon that. So that's how you can kind of keep the momentum so the wheels don't fall off at the end. Remind them how they got to those three runs. Remind them how they got to those six runs, whatever it is, and just keep, keep pushing them out of their comfort zone. Like, hey, do you think you can get four runs next inning? Have them try it out. If they think four, they will get it. Um, they might, they might get it, but it's, it's kind of like instilling that positivity into their brains, like, and their potential. So that would be the way that was a really long answer, Renee, but thank you for asking that question. I thought it was really good and I hope that it helps you here. Um, okay. So Moose asked a question. He said, you're a taller hitter. 
Yep, I'm 5'11", very tall. I think, how tall are you? 5'11". My daughter seems to grow a ton each year. She's currently 5'9 in eighth grade. Wow. In eighth grade, I was 5'1". Just wanted to throw that out there. This seems to affect her hitting mechanics. Tips for taller hitters. Okay, so she already is like way taller than I was in eighth grade but I did go through massive growth spurts and I actually had a lot of pain because I grew so fast. I grew like four inches in a summer, which is like absolutely insane. Um, but because I grew so much and these lengthy arms just came out of nowhere, I had to figure out, you know, what how to still be effective um, with, you know, my new body, right? So when I was young, when I was little, I wasn't very much of a power hitter. Like I was like singles hitter, like get it through the infield, like got to use as much as as much like got to use my muscles as much as I have I'm going to go all out but now I'm like growing and I'm lengthy and I have like this massive strike zone things kind of got crazy um but what I did the majority of the time when I started growing like crazy I didn't start lifting heavy weights right away but I did a lot of power and I did a lot of sprint work um, because sprinting is power um, so first step stuff so I would say really hone in on body weight exercises when it comes to like push-ups having really good shoulder strength um, this is for anybody that's growing I, I would say if you are growing exponentially at this one point you should not be lifting heavy weights yet because your body's not used to that like when your muscles are growing like they're basically like getting longer and they're not ready to hold heavy weight yet so I would say do a lot of jumping exercises power um, do a lot of push-ups because there there is so much amazingness in a push-up I mean it's like shoulders core legs your, your legs are still involved in that too so I would say do a lot of body weight exercises that are gonna work on strength and your power um, because I'm telling you what I so when I made that growth spurt I was like a junior in high school and before I was a junior in high school I'd only hit like a couple home runs in my career and then I started going nuts my junior and senior year when I was actually my height um, because I really figured out how to use the ground well um, and so when I grew like these super long and lengthy legs, if you guys go and check out my swing or my stance, my legs are super wide, super wide. I laugh when I try to work with a new athlete that's like really young and I get to my stance and she tries to put her feet <laughs> as far as mine. And I'm like, hey sister, my hips go up to your, to your nose. You realize you shouldn't be as far apart as me. But as my legs started getting longer, I started getting wider so that I could use the ground and the force of the ground to help my swing more. Um, so really I would hone in off, you're getting like these super long limbs, get a little bit wider so you can actually drive off of your back foot so much better with length that you can get into some balls and like I said I would not try to be lifting heavy weights yet <laughs> like don't do that until you know you're pretty much done growing um, people joke and they say I'm still growing I'm not um, but I would really focus on doing just like body weight um, you know jumping so jump for height jump for broad jumps like really hone into that stuff because even though I was skinny I was mighty I was able to hit the ball far and I was I was able to hit it hard um, even though I was tiny and I had like little tiny legs I I used the maximum amount of power I possibly could have and that's why I ended up hitting I think it was like I don't know, was it 11 help runs my senior? I don't even know. Um, but that's how I was able to help myself um, hit the ball hard. So I love that your daughter is already that tall. That's amazing. She's actually probably going to figure out her swing faster than I could because my swing changed a lot um, growing into my new, my new body, right? Because I was growing so tall. Um, but Moose, that's a really good question, and I hope I was able to help you answer that. Um, RT coach, I trust you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for asking the question. Um, Bella's asking, what are some of your favorite pregame snacks? Um, so it's a really good question. Pregame snacks. I was huge. Like my dad, he used to run marathons all the time and he rides now. But like cliff bars were like a thing that were always in my household. Um, so we had cliff bars and I would eat those before games a lot because it's like it's, it's a kind of like a meal in a bar and I, I never wanted to eat something like super heavy um, but I can tell you that like early morning road trips where dad and I would leave at like 4 a.m. a lot of times we'd go to like McDonald's and get like these the breakfast tacos or burritos um, we used to get those when I was little um, but as I got older and I started playing in college I realized that is something that I could do when I was younger and not when I was older so I would recommend doing something that's like it's got some 
Carbohydrates, so complex carbs, is energy. And you need a lot of energy to play the game of softball. Any game, really. Um, I would say definitely protein, because we are doing a lot of power in our swings. We're doing a lot of just power in general. And when you're when you're working out so much, because playing the game, st starting and stopping, moving fast, um, playing whatever position you play, hitting, like that requires a lot of muscle. And so when your muscles are being worked, you definitely need some protein. So I would say have some protein, you know, a little bit before the game, definitely have some protein after the game, especially. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to hone in on this one. Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. You can never drink too much water before a game. And I know that's probably not actually true. Like you can drown yourself if you drink too much water, but I guarantee you most of us are not doing that. Um, but I would say like when it comes to snacks, like, yeah, eat something with those, with protein and carbs. Um, but also make sure you're taking tons and tons of water because when you're lethargic or you're moving slow a lot of it can be either you just had a fatty meal or something like a burger before a meal don't ever play a game and eat a burger but a lot of times when you're tired it's also because you haven't had enough water um, so that was a pretty normal snack for me definitely Gatorades I cannot tell you how many times my mom was shoving Gatorades into my um, into my dugout, <laughs> not in college, but before that, definitely have, you know, something where when you know you're going to sweat, have some Gatorade because there's some electrolytes and, and salt that you sweat out that you can have in Gatorade. So that is a really good question. <sighs> I think that's pretty much it. Beef jerky. I love beef jerky. It keeps me full and it's kind of light. So definitely pregame snacks. I would say veer away from the greasiness. Like don't have some biscuits, biscuits and gravy before you go play. It's going to slow you down, especially if you like to steal bases like me. Don't have that. Um, have something light, but also has definitely complex carbs and protein um, and definitely like fruits. Absolutely. I would say fruits were huge. Watermelon. Q. No, that's not a, that's not a fruit. What would we have? Just a lot of strawberries, bananas, um, I love fruit, love fruit. So that's a really good thing to have before games. Okay, good question, Bella. Let's go to Facebook. Um, Vincent, seeing as though the times we are in are unprecedented, how would you recommend the girls to keep positive? Okay, I love this question because um, people joke, they're like, you're always positive, you're always smiling, you're always happy. And I'm like, that's not, that's not always the case. Um, but what I would say to stay positive and to stay energized really in this time is, um, really, you know, focus on the things that you look forward to. So like once this, these unprecedented times are done, what are you going to do? Like, what's the first thing you're going to do when you get to practice with your team for the first time? What is something that you can't wait to do when you get to go play with your team again? Um, really start like kind of dream, dreaming, imagining, getting excited about the future because just like anything, this too shall pass. This will end. I guarantee it. Like it will pass. Um, but being able to kind of like anticipate and get excited about the things that you're looking forward to can kind of pump you up and, and make and make you say, okay, well, if I'm excited to go play with my team again soon, well, maybe today I should go throw with my dad. Maybe today I should go hit in the backyard with my dad. Um, so like you'll start doing things regarding the things that you're excited about. So if you're excited to go play with your team, keep reminding yourself how excited you are to play and make sure you're doing some things at home so that you're ready for that game or you're ready for that practice. So you don't show up a little rusty, which we're all going to show up a little rusty to whatever we're doing, right? Like it's been a while, um, but really focus on the things that you can control right now. Um, I would also say to, to stay positive, get rid of the negative on social media. I will always, always say this. If you have social media and you follow people that, you know, give yourself a pit in your stomach whenever you, um, think of them or read their comments, maybe they're super negative. If you're around people or you're around things that are negative, you're likely going to feel that way. So if you want to be more positive, you need to follow some positive people. Like I guarantee you, you type in the word positive on Instagram and you're going to find a bunch of like positive quotes, positive motivation, like things that are going to get you in the right headspace rather than not. So if you have trouble being positive, like I challenge you to go through your phone, go through all like Snapchat, TikTok, um, Facebook, Instagram, whatever you're on, check it. If there are people that are negative, delete them. It doesn't matter what they think. If they come at you and they say, why did you delete me? Um, I would say, and it takes a little bit of courage to say this, be like, um, being, seeing your stuff made me kind of feel down or negative. Um, and so I want to follow people that are more positive. And if they don't like that answer, they're not your people. 
okay? So follow people that inspire you, that encourage you, um, that you truly like seeing their stuff. I would say really work on that too. It'll help you stay positive. I don't watch the news right now because a lot of it's negative. I will definitely find a way to figure out what the big news is going on. Um, but find things that make you happy, do the things that make you happy, and you will likely be a lot more positive during these crazy times. Are you superstitious? What does your pregame routine look like? Visualization, music, etc. Okay, superstition is not something that I believe in. I know a lot of people that do, and being superstitious works for them. Um, and yes, if it makes somebody happy, like I'll kind of like follow along the train, but I'm not super superstitious. Like if um, if there was like a certain routine that I did let's say, before like a really good game. Yeah, I wanna keep doing that stuff because whatever I did worked, right? So I guess you can say I'm not superstitious. Like I'm not gonna like fall asleep with my bed underneath my, or sorry, my bat underneath my pillow because I think that that's gonna make me hit better. No, I'm not really superstitious in that way. But the routines that worked for me, especially in college, um, I would try to reiterate those things that worked out for me. So this kind of goes along with your next question is like, what was your pregame routine? And pregame, like it, I was not like super adamant about, you know, like time and what specific songs am I listening to? But something that I did do that made the one of the biggest differences for me is before, especially the big games, I should have done this before every game, but before the big games, I would pull up video of my best swings. So if there was like a game that we played against a certain team, I would find a way to record that video and keep it stored in a place where I always know where it is. Because if I wanted to show up at my best, I wanted to remind myself of what my best looked like. Because that's a way for me to visualize what I want to look like in this next game. So if I, if I had a really successful game, I was clearly confident in that game, right? So if I keep looking at that and I, and I remind myself, okay, this is what I look like. Sorry, just got kind of windy. Um, this is what I look like in the box. Um, I smoke that ball to left center. I want to do that again. So I keep watching that video and I will put it on repeat until I can look and imagine that thing with my eyes closed. Because guess what I do right before my first at bat and actually all of my at bats is I imagine myself doing something successful. Like that's my best at bats, that's what I did. So because I had reviewed before my game my best swings and I could close my eyes before my at bat, see myself do that step in the box, I am setting myself up for success because I'm visualizing what I want to do um, in regards to where do I want to put it, how hard do I want to hit it, things like that. So that was that was a pregame routine that I um, loved doing, loved doing. Um, and this is gonna sound like a silly one, but before every game, at least in college, not in, not in pro really, um, one of the things to kind of settle me in and kind of get me ready um, was braiding people's hair. <laughs> and I know that probably sounds stupid, um, but whenever we would be on the bus, like how to do a tournament, I would braid my teammates hair and it was like prepping them to be successful, to be ready, right? To feel good. They say, look good, feel good, play good. Um, for, for me, it was like, okay, getting them ready, braiding their hair, making them feel good. Like that's what I did. And like the biggest pregame routine thing that I did that like, I would never play a game without doing this is I put on my eye black. And I am telling you right now, my eye black was what made me feel fierce. It's what made me feel like BA. So my eye black was something that I put on before every single game. So if there was one thing, there was, if there was only one thing I could do before a big game, I would say even before reviewing my best swings, it would be putting on my eye black. Because like I felt like a whole, like I felt like a warrior with my eye black on. So I'd put like a big, this is what I did. I put like a big chunk, big line right here, which this stick that I was using was already like super thick. So I'd basically just do one super thick line right here. And then I would take my two fingers and I would just like rush it down my face like that. So that's how I did my eye black. And it like went down my cheek and not every day was perfect, but that's okay. I would spend a good like five to 10 minutes on my eye black though. That's how serious I took doing my eye black. Um, so that is a routine that I did um, before every single game. Every single game was eye black. Most games it was reviewing my favorite swings. Um, but braiding hair was something that I did in college. That was like one of my favorite routines that I did. Um, so I love that question. Rob Bradley's here, Kenzie's here. How's it going? Um, like the idea of replaying video of success. Yes, that was a way I visualized. I absolutely love that. Um, that's one of my favorite, favorite things that I did as a player and I really think it can help other people. Seeing as though you played at a high, a high level of college and your sister is currently also playing division one in college, 
Um, so my middle sister, Christina, she's at UNC, and I actually have another sister that's playing volleyball in college at Old Dominion. Um, so we have a pretty athletic family. What are the differences between the two of you with regard to the sport, even though you were instructed by your dad? Um, I guess I would say, like, she's really good at her own thing, too. So she's actually a natural lefty. Um, so her whole life, she's been swinging left-handed, throwing left-handed. I only hit left-handed. Um, so I threw right-handed, hit left-handed, and I decided to do that when I was 12. Um, so like the physical difference is she's a true lefty, um, was kind of limited on where, what position she could play growing up. So she actually probably got way better at the outfield than I ever did because she played, a, she played it a lot more. Um, she played that in first base, but mostly outfield. So I think she was able to get so much better at the outfield than me because she was a true lefty, played mostly outfield. So she played it a lot more than me growing up, which is why she's like a stellar center fielder. Um, man, I love watching her play. I think that she has a true advantage um, because she grew up with me as her big sister. So like, if I was out hitting with my dad, Christina would always come and either watch or hit some balls with us. And she was just like always around the game. And so like me growing up, I didn't really have an older sister because I'm the oldest. So I was kind of like, and she said this before, I'm not like putting words into her head, that I was kind of like always motivating her to like go practice. So she kind of had like an, a little advantage, which is I, completely think that she's way better than I was. She's a redshirt junior in college and I think she's way better than I ever was. Um, and she probably hates when I say that, but it's true I, and it's absolutely true. And I think that was probably why is because she was always around the game. Um, my dad will even tell you, he's just like, you know, when you first started playing, I didn't really know much about softball. So that's probably why like she, like I would say she's going to be so much better because her whole life was around it. And like we, my dad and I kind of had to learn the game together and then teach Christina. So she had a little bit of an advantage there, which is all why she's better than me. Like, it's just fact. So I think that was like some of the cool things about having a younger sister and two younger sisters is that like, she's always looking up to me. They're always looking up to me on all the things that I do. So if anything, I kind of loved that, but also didn't like it at the same time. Cause when things were bad, like all I wanted to do was just like tell everybody how bad things were. But if I did that with my sisters, they may not love the game. They may not love sports. So like I kind of held that in a little bit when I played. Um, I'm definitely going off on a tangent with this question. But this is like true stuff. This is stuff that I felt. Um, but yeah, I think she's very unique in her own way. She is more, so when she, I will say one more thing. She, so she's a natural lefty. Um, she is very fast. So she's probably as fast as me. She broke my high school record actually at Dwanger. Um, for stolen bases. She's very fast. I was also fast and I loved base running. She loves it too. Um, but what she has done that I didn't always do was my first three, two years in college, I was like a triple threat for those two years. So I was bunting, I was soft slapping, I was hard slapping, I was hitting for power, but she has mostly hit for power the whole time. When my final two seasons were the only two seasons I was hitting for power and bunting a lot. So like she, um, I think like has that more of that potential as a hitter because like she's been power hitting most of her career. She did a little bit of slapping at one point, um, but that's a little bit of differences between our games. Um, but what was great was my dad was always saying like, you're good at what you're good at and we're gonna continue to be good at those things. Um, we were very similar in a lot of ways, but you know, I think my biggest successes were when I was a power hitter and that may be why Christina veered away from the slapping a little bit more. Um, which helped her out tremendously. So that was a really good question. Um, I love talking about my sisters. I love talking about, um, you know, how I was raised and, what, and how we practiced together, you know, in the backyard, literally in this backyard that I'm sitting in right now. Yes, I hit a couple balls into some neighbor's yards, but I never hit a house, so that's okay. Um, I should probably go around to these neighbors and be like, hey, I'm really sorry for scaring the crap out of you when you were hitting, or when I was hitting and I hit a ball into your yard. Um, did that a couple times, <laughs> but day in the life, like that's just how it was growing up in our household, which is why I'm so excited to do this podcast. I'm so excited to do a podcast and, um, talk to my parents and talk to, you know, other, other athletes, high level athletes to see how they got to where they were and their relationships with their parents growing up. Because I think there's so much that we can learn, um, you know, from other people and their journeys. Um, it's, and it's not like a thing where I want you to say, oh man, like I'm not doing that right. I want it to be like, 
oh my gosh, this is how she was raised and this is why she's so good at that. This is how she was raised and this is why she's so good at that. Wow, I do something just like her, um, just like their family and this is what's working for us. And what I love is everybody's story from to where they are now is different right everybody's story is different everybody is standing where they are because of all the different experiences that they've had which is why i'm excited to interview top level athletes to interview parents of athletes and see you know what was it that those parents did to get those athletes to where they are and this is this is the journey that i'm excited for this is why i'm excited to start this podcast it's actually going to be up within the next few months so i can tell you that um so i'm very 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 excited about this and i hope you guys are too um, because it's going to be some real awesome conversation. I'm so pumped about this. So this is actually the first time I think I've told anyone about this. So, so happy that you guys are the first ones to hear this. Um, and I hope that, um, you guys will enjoy this content as much as I'm going to love creating it and having conversations with top dogs in the sport and, you know, great parents who've raised some great kids. Like this is why I'm excited to share my story because it's me who I played college and pro, got a younger sister playing in college, I got another sister playing volleyball in college, and it's like, holy smokes, people are like, how did your parents do it? And I'm like, I don't even know. I don't. So how about we ask them (laughs) and then see what people have to say? So that's going to be the conversation on the podcast. I'm very excited for it. I ended up talking way longer than I planned, so I got to go meet my family. But y'all are awesome. Thanks for tuning in. Um, If you could and you like this conversation, you think people would like it, if you could either screenshot or share this conversation with your friends or with your softball tribe, um, I think that would be awesome because some of you guys had some fire questions that I was excited to answer and I loved, loved, loved your questions. So I think I'm going to do more Q&As like this more often. Um, give me a like or give me a heart if you guys want more Q&As like this because I think this is this is the type of conversation I love having. Kind of impromptu, kind of fun, made me think. Love it. So let's keep continuing to stay positive in this crazy time. Keep hanging out with the people that you like to hang out with that make you feel good about yourself. Um, By the way, if you guys want to hit with me, I hit with athletes every single Friday night from 4 to 5 p.m. Go to my website, ashleybtraining.com. If you want to hit with me, I would love it. Um, And with that, stay positive, shine your light. See you guys later.